we've got two more talks before coffee, and the first of those is um, from Dr. Gloria Lopez Castion. She's the deputy lead for cellular immunology. She's uh, an early career, one of our early career rising stars. She was the recipient of one of the first MCCIR prize postdoctoral fellows where we tried to kickstart um, the careers of, of the most promising young individuals. Uh, since then, she's gone on in 2015 to be awarded a, a Wellcome Trust Sir Henry Dale Fellowship. So, Gloria. Thank you, Tracy. So, good morning, everyone. So, we have two more talks before coffee break, so please hang on. Um, trying to be clear and, and quick. So, yes, so Tracy, so I'm the deputy lead for the cellular immunology branch, and uh, what I would like to do today is basically run you through what I think are the main ideas we're following with this, within this theme and show you some of the research we are doing. Of course, it's just a 15-minute talk, so I cannot talk about everything that's going on in the theme, so I really encourage you to talk to people throughout the day and come to me or to Dan, which is the lead of the branch, and we can actually point out to several people if you need to talk to someone in particular. So from the title of our branch, the name of our branch, this is the simple question that will come out to your mind. These people are just looking at what immune cells do and how they do it. And yes, that's the, the short answer, but the long answer is do, we do more than that. So for now, again, if you are not very uh, familiar with immunology or, or not very deep in that yet, like maybe like master students, you can think, we know now everything about cells. We've described so many types of immune cells throughout the years that we're pretty much done with this. I would like to disagree, and actually the fact is that more and more immune cells are coming up, more new functions of immune cells are coming up, and we actually need to tackle uh, these things and go deeper and deeper. So I'd like to start with one of the things that the branch is doing uh, quite, uh, quite well and quite a lot, and actually John is touched on this, and is defining new functions for immune cells, and hopefully and potentially maybe we can also identify new immune cells. And he showed the examples of the lung, for example. We're still in a human lung. We don't really know what immune cells are there and what the immune cells exactly are doing. And that's one of the things that the branch is doing. And also, he also mentioned the work of Joe Conkel, where you can see how the same type of cell might develop different in one area or the other. And in fact, that means that we don't really understand what's going on within the cells in the whole body. The other thing that, again, goes back a bit to the lung is how the environment shapes the function of these cells. So the environment is going to be critical, and I think, again, in particular for the human in the past years, we've focused more in just taking the blood out and looking at what immune cells that are in the blood and assuming that was the, what happened all over the body. Now we know this is not the case because, of course, depending on what the cells are, there are going to be different cell interactions, different soluble factors, the matrix is going to play a role, and of course the location is going to be very important. And um, again, location is key, and we now, again, coming back to what John mentioned all the barriers, we know that different barriers are, you know, are different and they're going to be doing different functions, and in Manchester there's lots and lots of people working in different barriers or organs and trying to really dissect what the immune cells are doing there. But it's not only the location that is going to determine what immune cell is doing. You also need to think of how the environment within that location might change. So one of the things that it might change is aging. So you have the same immune cells in, let's say, the lung when you're young, and then as you age, probably they're not going to be doing the same. So we need to really understand what's happening uh, in health when we are young, and also how we progress in life to really understand how we can achieve healthy aging, for instance, and how can we tackle this. The other important thing that we do in Manchester is circadian clocks. And, and again, that's something that's coming up, and I think Mark might be mentioning about that later, is that depending on what time of the day we're at, the immune cells might have different behavior. And again, this might be crucial in understanding how this whole uh, immune response works, and it might be important uh, later on if we want to give maybe some treatments or do surgery in the mornings or at night, or all of this we really need to understand to follow on. The other thing is disease, and of course, um, John's mentioned that as well. Disease is going to change everything again. And I've used here the example of cancer, because obviously we also have links with the cancer immunology, but any disorder of disease, and as uh, Nancy mentioned, pretty much any disease has an immune component, is going to change the environment. So it's key that we really understand that. And of course, infection, and again, uh, Richard will talk later about the parasite um, 
branch, all of these things are going to change the microenvironment where the cells are going to be on, on top of the location. And of course, we know metabolism is going to come in if we change these things, hypoxia, anything that you can think of is going to be changing all the time. So on top of that, we again have the other question, which is heterogeneity of the cells. We've assumed uh, in the past that if you have a cell population, they are going to behave the same. And now it's becoming more and more clear that this is not the case. And we don't really understand why this is. So you know, we know that you have an immune cell population, and you trigger and you activate them with something. Not all of the cells are going to respond in the same way. Some of the cells might respond in the same way for one particular uh, cytokine, but not to the other one. And we really don't understand what the difference from that are. And then this could be because actually there are different subpopulations, going back to the first um, point that made, or it can be that actually not all the cells respond in the same way as a way of protecting or modulating the immune responses. And the final thing that we are really trying to do in the, in the branch is then dissect the molecular mechanisms by which the changes on the function of, of the cells that I just mentioned are being controlled. And again, that will all together, I think, will tackle the new questions that the cellular immunology field has at the moment. So surprisingly, John and I came with the same slide so without talking to each other, but uh, that kind of uh, highlights the synergy we have between the, between the branches. The cells are the main component of the immune system, so therefore we are going to be present in pretty much all the branches and, and what people is doing. So it's not surprising. I've just uh, linked it to some of the ones where people are linked officially to the cellular immunology branch, but I think many other people will actually come and join us uh, as the uh, institute develops. What I would like to also highlight is the approaches we're using and why Manchester is the key place to do this as well. So you can see within the branch we have a whole range of models, so we go from proper, what I call proper in vitro work with either set lines or primary cells. We use different in vivo models, so we use several fish mouse models, and we then can also go into human. And again, we have uh, great access to human tissue and human samples in Manchester. Not only the lung, but people get uh, access to gut, to skin, and that really is allowing us to tackle and interrogate what the immune cells are doing in a human and in a relevant environment. But of course, we cannot do that without any of the new technologies that are coming up to look at single cell. And Manchester, we have really well suited for doing multi-parameter flow cytometry and CYTOF, and, and John showed some data on that. Of course, single cell RNA seq. Now we're doing more and more on this, and that's really going to allow us to understand what's happening in the different uh, immune cell populations. And that, if you link it to cell sorting, the fact that we now can sort rare immune populations or your favorite immune population, then we can start dissecting what's happening at the single cell level in immune cells. We cannot forget about microscopy, and again, we have really good facilities at Manchester, but of course, Dan, which we'll talk later, is doing super resolution, and that's also allowing us to really understand how cells are behaving at the single cell level. So what I would like to do now is just uh, mention uh, very briefly uh, some of the research we are doing that hopefully covers some of the aspects I've been uh, talking about. So first, is uh, very briefly about the lung, because again, John is touching that, so um, just like to highlight that Peter Cook and Andrew McDonald, both labs are collaborating and looking at how the uh, lung environment can shape uh, immune cell responses. So they've um, uh, initially um, characterized to the single cell level what in the immune cells are in the lung, and what they're asking now is whether actually being in the lung makes a difference or not. And uh, of course, when you start, I'm not going to really talk about this, so they're going to be here around the day, but you could start asking what aspects of the lung are, are shaping the immune cell response, because they found that, yeah, if a cell is in the lung, it's going to behave differently. So we really need to understand how they behave differently in health, but also when you have allergy or some of the things that, uh, infection that can affect uh, lung function, how this uh, shapes immune response. So I'd just like to um, give you some of the uh, results they found that I think is quite uh, interesting, is that they found that the lung can modify the metabolic state of macrophages, and that can really have an impact on how these cells respond uh, to a TH2 challenge, for example, in an allergy situation or to a aspergillus. So I just like pointing to the poster because they actually have a poster, so I'm sure they're going to explain this much better than me, so I'll leave it there for now. 
So the second thing I'd like to uh, uh, show you today is the work that Pavel Pasek is doing in understanding heterogeneity of, uh, of cells and in the context of infection in this case. So Pavel is uh, developing his lab a lot of different approaches to, to study single cells. He's first of all um, done a really good system on um, transducing cells, immune cells with antivirus. So that allows him to label immune cells and follow what's happening at the single cell level. So anyone that works with this knows that transfecting immune cells is really hard. So this system works really well. We're actually also using it in my lab. Then he also developed a microfluidic system where now he can um, change the environment of the cells to a really controlled level, and that then allows him to look at the dynamics and the timing of, of events that are happening in the cells at the single cell level. You can also then add uh, endogenous gene expression to these by the single cell sequencing we mentioned before, or, or RNA fish, for example. And all of this then he also uses to do mathematical modeling and try to understand and explain what's happening in these cells. So I think this is a really uh, nice approach to study this kind of thing. And now he's applying all of this to try to understand this question, which is why some cells kill pathogens and others do. And I felt like I thought it was quite striking to see that data, the fact that he's using Listeria. If you add Listeria to your macrophages in this case, you can see that Listeria invades pretty much all of the cells, but only a few of them, a few of the cells we have a good uh, infection and replication of the, of the bacteria. So why is it that, as you can see at the bottom, 90% of the cells are gonna clear the infection, and only 1% of the cells are gonna actually contribute to the spread, while all the cells have been exposed to exactly the same conditions and the same infection. So his hypothesis is that this is a host defense mechanism, and maybe this heterogeneity can actually protect or contribute to the to the control of the infection. So this is the work has been done with uh, Professor Ian Roberts, and again, Pavel is somewhere, so he'll probably again explain this in more detail if needed. And I'd like to uh, finish with some work we're doing in the lab, so uh, going to a more molecular aspect of what's happening in immune cells. And in my lab, we're interested in, in the inflammasome, and the inflammasome, for those who don't know, is just a key molecular complex which is essential for the release of two pro-inflammatory cytokines, which you've all heard of, pro-interleukin, uh, sorry, interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 18. So if you don't have an inflammasome, you won't have the release of these cytokines, and therefore you won't be able to contribute to the inflammatory response in this aspect. So the inflammasome is triggered by a lot of different danger signals, and you name one, so usually it can come from pathogens, but also can be sterile signals. So things that are coming from injury, for example, extracellular ATP, but also things that accumulate in disease, like cholesterol crystals or uh, monosodium urate crystals that are uh, traditional of gout, for instance. So what we're trying to do now is trying to dissect what the ubiquitin system is doing in this. So we know that uh, the inflammasome is activated by the signals I mentioned, but still it's a big, big question mark on what and how this is happening. So just to um, remind you, I'm sure you all know what the ubiquitin is, that we're interested in G-ubiquitinases, which are the enzymes that remove ubiquitin from a target protein. And we want to understand if the ubiquitinases can sense danger, and if they do, how they respond to danger, and how they contribute to this. So I'll be talking today about two uh, ubiquitinases in particular, USP7 and USP47, and uh, I'll tell you that we're working on both of them because they share uh, a catalytic domain, so that is critical for the function of these proteins, which has a 50% similarity, and people think that they might be doing the same function, but it's just not clear whether they do or they don't. So we're always working with the two of them separately and together to see what they are doing. And to try to make this short, uh, what we've been looking is at how the activity of these enzymes change when they're uh, um, exposed to the danger signal. So what you can see uh, here uh, is that if we activate the cells with an endotoxin, just triggering NF-kappa beta pathway, so in this case we don't have an active inflammasome, we see that you look at the bottom band, it's telling you that the, the, the protease is inactive and the top band is active. There's no real change from no LPS or LPS. 
Now the important thing comes if we add something that we know activates the inflammasome on top of the LPS, this toxin called nigericin. If you now look at the bands, you can see how the bottom one shifts to the top, telling you that this protease is becoming activated by this danger signal. And the same thing happens for USP47. So these proteases can actually sense the, the danger, and this is the first time this has been shown. And then what we did next is then question whether they can actually then control inflammasome activation. And what we did is knocking down these two ubiquitinases in, in THP1, so a macrophage-like cell line. And if you look at this band here in the wild types, you have the band and it completely disappears when you knock them down. And the same thing with this caspase one, which is just a readout of inflammasome activation. So therefore, we've identified two new um, molecules that are involved in, in sensing danger and reporting to inflammasome activation, and we're trying to dissect the, the final uh, mechanism. So I'll actually just leave it there, um, and I would like to obviously thank you everyone for listening, but I would like to also say that all of this is done in contribution of academics, clinicians, and industry, and without the synergy and the work between all of them and the other branches, I don't think this, the work of this branch will go anywhere, really. So thank you everyone that's contributing to this. Thank <laughs> you.